Probably the most asked question when we're making small talk with somebody new is, what do you do? Right? What do you do for work? And most often we're expecting a, a label that identifies, you know, the work that we do. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it, but so often the label doesn't capture what it is that we do. Because our work, our profession is so much more than the label or even the job description that's a part of the work that we do. And I hope today as we dive into this final installment of getting back to work that that comes home to you, that you realize that the work that you do, the label that you bear in your profession is just a small part of what God has called you to do in your work. And we've been looking at the same verse. I hope it's becoming familiar to you. Maybe you've even put it to memory, uh, at least part of it in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians. We're going to take it one piece at a time right now, just as we look at the various pieces of this. It says 1 Thessalonians 4, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact you do love all God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. So it begins with love, right? Our profession is about how we love each other. That's first and foremost who we are as children of God, as those who've been transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Love is what we lead with all the time. But that can be a nebulous thing. I just want to talk about a couple of things that make that really bring it home to our work. That means when we go to work, we assume the best about the people that we work with, our co-workers, our clients, uh, the people that we work for and with, we assume the best about them. That's not an easy thing to do. You know, sometimes it seems like our, our boss is really demanding and maybe they have high expectations for us. Maybe they want the best for us. That's kind of what we assume about them. Maybe our coworkers seem distant or difficult, and we assume that they're dealing with challenges at home and that we want to come alongside them in a unique way. So instead of just assuming what's negative about the people that we work with or about the clients that we serve, we do our very best to love them by assuming the best and allowing them uh, giving them some grace, allowing them some mistakes, and allowing them some brokenness. And we do the very best that we can to win them over. We not only assume the best, but we speak the best about our boss, our co-workers, and our clients. That's the nature of what it means to love first in the work that we do. And the last one is that we choose to love our work and the people that we work with and for. Love is a choice. You've probably heard that. And that's not an easy choice to, to love because we would rather complain. We would rather gossip. We would rather grumble about our work and grumble about the people that we work with. But whatever it is that God has given us to do in this moment, we say, you know what? I'm going to choose to love my work. I'm going to choose to love the people that I work with. And we, when we begin to put love first and we make those choices, it transforms not only the work that we do, but the way people see us in the work that we do. And none of that is captured, right? None of that is captured when people ask us, what do you do? Right? That, that's not in our job description. Uh, that's not in the label that we're giving. But as followers of Jesus Christ, that's what we lead with. We lead with love. We assume the best. We speak the best. And we choose to love. Now the next part of 1 Thessalonians 4 says, And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Most of us, that does, that's not the good definition of ambition, right? To be ambitious means we want to grab for more. We want to go get it. We are go-getter people. Not to lead a quiet life. We naturally want recognition. At least I do. I don't know about you, but when I do work, I want recognition. It's just 
natural. It's so much a part of how we're wired up that we want that recognition. Even if it's something as simple as doing the lawn. You know, if nobody notices, if my wife or my kids don't notice, I'll just kind of drop hints. Man, it was hot today out there doing the yard work. You know, it's like, oh, then they'll say, oh, yeah, it looks great too. Thanks for doing that. And then I can feel good because I get recognized. The very definition of what it means to be a righteous person, to be righteous in the Bible, means that we put others ahead of ourselves, that we are ambitious for other people. That we're not ambitious for ourselves, but we're ambitious for others. That's what it means to lead a quiet life. Sometimes we feel discouraged or disappointed if people don't notice what we do in our work, if our boss doesn't notice what we do in our work. But from God's perspective here in 1 Thessalonians 4, that's part of the deal. Part of the deal is that we quietly serve other people, that we don't look, we don't do it for recognition, we're not grasping for recognition, we just lead a quiet life and uh, we serve other people in the process. Third thing here in 1 Thessalonians 4, you should mind your own business. Remember, we've said this along the way, that that, that doesn't mean, you know, you, you just keep to yourself and don't meddle in other people's business. That's the common understanding of this phrase, but that's not what it means here in 1 Thessalonians. It means tend to your business. And I think it means hone your skills. Be really good at what you do. My friend Tom, who I got to spend some time with recently, he, he works for waste management in a, in a transfer station. So the neighborhood trucks come into his building, dump all their stuff, and then the semis come in and they haul all of that neighborhood garbage to the local landfill. So Tom's responsibility is to drive this loader, this huge end loader that picks up all the garbage and fills all the semis. And Tom, you know, in, in part, he could say, man, I'm working in garbage. You know, I'm just going to bide my time here. I'm going to do everything I can just to get to 5 o'clock when I can get off. And, and he works some crazy hours. But, but he says, you know, I want to be the very best at what I do. And the drivers love him because in every other transfer station they work at, they have difficulty. But when they come to Tom's station, they know they're going to get in and out just as quickly as possible. Because Tom is going to do everything he can to get their trucks loaded to do an efficient and clean job of, of getting it done just as fast as he can. So the drivers, both the neighborhood trucks and the, the semi-drivers, they all appreciate Tom's work because he does it quickly and he does it efficiently and he does it well. So he's honed his skill and the bosses love him and the truck drivers love him. Why? Because he's working hard to hone his skill in waste management. And it makes all the difference in the way people look at him and the way his work gets done. Last one is this in 1 Thessalonians 4. And I know a lot of times in the message we usually wait till the end to do all this really practical stuff, but I want to come out of the gate with the very practical stuff this morning. And the next one is this. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, uh, work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. We work to provide values to others. In doing so, we gain the respect of outsiders. And that's a huge piece. You know, that we want to work in such a way that people look at our lives and they see something unique and something different. That we're striving for something beyond ourselves, and that's why we, we want to add value to our work. And we want to add value to the people that we serve in our work. And the more we do that, the more we, we serve others. And then we're not dependent on anybody else too. It says that here at the end. Then you're not dependent on anybody. If we're constantly struggling to pay the bills, if we're constantly struggling just to, to make ends meet and survive in life, and that's kind of our goal is our own survival, then we, we can't live a generous life. So when we we provide value to the work that we do and provide value to others, then our work's going to grow. And we're going to be able to develop in our lives in a way that we can live a generous life. That when we accumulate more, that we're able to give more to the people in our lives. And that's going to impact the world in a powerful way. 
So those are some practical things right out of 1 Thessalonians 4. And that, I hope, begins to shape how we think about our work. Now I want to look beyond that. If we live and if we work that way, what does that look like on a daily basis? Well, first off, I think it means we write a new story for our work. And when I say new story, that reminds me of that Natasha Bedingfield song, I can feel the rain on your skin, feel the rain on your skin, no one else can feel it for you, only you can let it in. No one else, no one else can speak the words on your lips, drench yourself in words unspoken. And then the chorus goes over and over again, the rest is still unwritten, it's unwritten. And I think we can start today in rewriting the story of our work. That maybe up to this point, it's just been, you know, we're biding our time. We're living for that five o'clock bell to get done. And we can't wait to live life when we get away from work. And we've talked about that rhythm of rest and work, and that's vital. But that doesn't mean we, we bide our time in our work, that we just survive or we get by in our work. We want to thrive in the work that we do. And that means we write a different story for our work. When we do these things that we've talked about so far, our work becomes another way that we show the love of Christ to the world. The church often gives the impression that we own, the only way that we show Christ's love is when we speak of it. And that's a vital part. That's an essential part of what we do as followers of Jesus Christ, that we speak of the hope that is in us. But we do it in so much more. The way that we work, the way that we cultivate life, the way that we redeem creation, sometimes by the work that we do, whether it's bringing healing or bringing order to this world, those things are transformative. And we are joining God in the work of cultivation and the work of transformation in this world in those what we sometimes think of as meaning, meaning, menial or insignificant things. We bring the transformation of God's Spirit to bear on this world, and it transforms our world. So here are some questions that we can ask in our work. What is the storyline that I want to work, write in my work journey? What are the underlying assumptions about meaning, morality, origin, and destiny? How does my profession tell the story, and what parts does my profession play in the story? What parts of my work are good, and what parts can only be redeemed without Christ and need to be challenged? How can I work with excellence, but also with Christian distinctiveness in skill, in Sabbath, in sacrifice, and in service. So those are just some questions that we can ponder. And I want to mention, you know, one of those is talks about the underlying assumptions. Here's the underlying assumptions. This is the big story. And that's how we always write our own stories is with an understanding of God's greater story. That this creation is good. God created this world good. And that impacts how we look at the work that we do in this creation. But we also know that this world is fallen. It's corrupted by sin. And that sometimes our work is going to have thorns and thistles like we talked about last week. And we need to do everything that we can to transform, to bring back, to restore the good order that God intended. And we know that that brings us to the person of Jesus Christ, that he has redeemed this world. And don't limit that to just meaning that Jesus has just saved us from hell, right? That's so often what we reduce God's work to through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's at the center of it. He has saved us for eternal life, but eternal life begins right now. Not when we die and go to heaven, but it begins right now. And so the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ, his transforming work through his death and resurrection impacts the work that we do every day. Because in our work, we are joining God in that redeeming work of our world. We are restoring God's good order. We are bringing justice where there is injustice. And all of that impacts how we live and work every single day. 
1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says this, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We do everything that we do, including our work, for the glory of God. We know there's something greater in this world, and we want to bring God's glory and His presence into every square inch of our lives. CBS ran an article uh, back in 2017. It said, Why So Many Americans Hate Their Jobs. And it talked about how so many of us fantasize about the day when we can gain enough wealth that we can just quit working, in part because we don't see the value in our work. And the article went on to say that surveys have been done that indicate that over 50% of the people are not engaged in their work. They don't like their work. They don't want to do this work. They're just not engaged in it. They're just biding their time. We need a new understanding. We need to write a new story for our work. For that, we need a new conception of our work. And that comes from James chapter 1, verse 17. It says this, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. I want to talk for a minute about the idea of common grace. Maybe you've heard that term. Maybe it's the first time you're ever hearing it. But I understand it in part this way. I think about Zach Brown Band. They're one of my favorite bands, and I just love listening to their music. I think about it in our mayor right here in Lake Worth Beach, Pam Triolo. I think about my mechanic. His name is Mo. I think it's short for Muhammad, and he's great. He's a great friend and a great mechanic. Uh, I think of Jimmy Butler. Uh, dude brought us to the finals for Miami, right, in basketball. We didn't win, but, man, I love that guy and how he plays basketball. I think of Liam Neeson. He's a great actor. I just love to watch him on the silver screen. I think of Charlie Agnew, the guy who's our electrician here on campus for Sunlight Church in Lake Worth. And, and man, the guy just does excellent work. And some of those people are followers of Jesus Christ, and some of them I don't know. And some of them probably are not. But I believe that for every single one of those people, great people, that God has given them the gifts that they have for leadership, for craftsmanship, for each of the things that they do, that God has gifted them to do what they do. You know, if I need brain surgery someday, heaven forbid that I would, but if I do, I, I'm not going to step back and say, well, I want to find a Christian brain surgeon, somebody who knows Jesus Christ can pray with me. You know, my priority in finding a brain surgeon is going to be finding somebody who knows their way around the brain, right? Who's done it before, hopefully hundreds of times, and they're going to, they're not going to mess anything up here and here when they do it. And I'm not, I'm going to, acknowledge, whether they acknowledge it or not, I'm going to know that God has given them the gift to do brain surgery. That's common grace, that we join so many other people in demonstrating God's gifts in the work that we do, in developing our skills and honing our skills. And, and the more we understand that, the more we, we can join and enjoy working with other people. And we're not condescending. We're not looking up or down. We understand that God has gifted each of us uniquely. And that's a new conception of work. Next piece is this. We need a new compass for work. The very definition, as I mentioned already, is uh, this idea of righteous people is that they disadvantage themselves in order to advantage other people. While the wicked are willing, willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. So the righteous will sacrifice themselves for the community, for other people, for the people they work with and their clients. While the wicked say, well, I'm going to do everything I can, even if it means uh, being a little bit dishonest, even if it means doing my work slower so that I get paid more hours for it, uh, whatever it is, I'm going to I'm going to disadvantage other people so that I can gain the advantage. Um, though none of us, you've heard that phrase, none of us gets to the end of our lives and you don't, you'll never see on a tombstone, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. However, at the same time, there may be the wish that we had brought more value in the work that we did. Value to the work 
and value to the world and to the people around us in the work that we do. Is that something we long for in our work? Well, historically, that's been something that followers of Jesus Christ have powerfully longed for as they thought about their their conception or the compass for work. Here are just a few examples of that. Johannes Kepler. These glasses that I keep taking on and off, the dude invented glasses. And not only that, but the, the orbit of the planets, he had it figured out before anybody else did. Uh, Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal. Uh, some of these folks, like Blaise Pascal, wrote books about following Jesus Christ, not just books about science. I mean, we know Pascal from math. He's a father of modern math in so many ways. And yet he also loved and pursued his relationship with God. Uh, Robert Boyle is the father of modern chemistry. John Ray is the father of uh, a founder of what we understand about biology and zoology. And every one of these guys sought to love and to know Jesus Christ as the first and most important thing in their lives. And because they did that, because they pursued Jesus Christ and they wanted to bring that transforming power of the gospel into every corner of their lives, they pursued science. And they, along with a host of other fellow Christians, brought about the scientific revolution in our world. In fact, a sociologist named Robert Stark actually researched this. How many of the scientists in the scientific revolution were followers of Jesus Christ? 98% of them were, which is Ironic today that so many scientists say you can't be a, a follower of Jesus Christ and believe in science at the same time. These folks thought of it as one and the same thing. They wanted to pursue excellence in their work because of their love for Jesus Christ. And today, Francis Collins is one of those guys. You may not have heard that name, but he's actually Dr. Fauci's boss. Uh, and he's a leader of the Human Genome Project. And he is a a lover of Jesus Christ, and he takes that into the work that he does. Here's, here's more examples. The greatest uh, universities. This is a list of not all, I couldn't fit all 10 of them on this list, but you get the idea. Uh, the best colleges in our country. And they were founded by people who were followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, eight of the 10 on the list were founded initially just to teach the Bible. They just wanted to teach the Bible. And now Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Cambridge, Oxford, Columbia, University of California, Berkeley, University of Chicago, um, Princeton, and others on that list, they were all founded by followers of Jesus Christ who were passionate to do their work well. I'll try to go quick. These are hospitals, top 10 hospitals in the world, and they were all but one was founded by people who were passionate to serve Jesus Christ and wanted to bring healing and transformation that was grounded in the gospel to their work. The Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, John Hopkins, Massachusetts General, University of Michigan, University of California, San Francisco Med Center, UCLA Med Center, and then Cedar sinai Med Center. That's the Jewish one on the list. But you get the idea. These people were all passionate followers of Jesus Christ who understood the big story that God had created the world good and had fallen and the redeeming work of Jesus Christ is transforming our world and bringing the kingdom of God right now. And that's what they did through their work in medicine. Last one. Some of the greatest revolutionaries had this conception of their work. I recently saw the movie uh, about Harriet Tubman, and what a powerful movie. And it brought home her faith and her belief in God and the power of Jesus Christ in her life. Frederick Douglass was another one. William Wilberforce, John Newton, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Mary, Mother Teresa, all of these people, revolutionaries in transforming our world who held tightly to the power of Jesus Christ in their lives. And that's what shaped the way they did their work. All right, let's wrap up with this. The new power for work. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, work done for our own worth, our own security, to try and bring meaning to our life through our work, that's dangerous. That leads us to, to burn out. That leads us to a place where we just bide our time in our work, where we don't love the work that we do. But when we work for God's glory, that's what Romans 12 here says, in view of God's mercy. I think of that Latin term that maybe you've heard, Coram Deo, that we live before the face of God in everything that we do. Uh, God is doing something greater than just your work, but he is using your work along with the transforming power of his son Jesus Christ and the work of the church in building the kingdom in the world. Your work plays its role in cultivating, in transforming, in redeeming this fallen world. And when we put that at the center of our work, we bring glory to him. We we continue the work that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross and we transform our world. And we not only live out the gospel, but we also speak it to the people that we serve. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thanks so much for the work and the meaning and the purpose that you give us. Lord, I pray that we would love our work and the people that we work with, that we would bring to bear the power of Jesus Christ and the work that he has done into our everyday lives and our work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You unravel me with melody You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child from my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again to a family Oh, your blood flows through my veins And I'm no longer a slave to fear For I am a child of God Yes, I'm no longer a slave to fear Through it, 
My fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me and I will stand and see I am a child of God Thanks for tuning in for this series on getting back to work. Uh, if you found something meaningful here that you want to share with others, like, share, do everything you can to get the word out uh, of God's word from Sunlight Community Church. And also want to direct you to Tim Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor. Uh, we've just scratched the surface. He digs deeper in an understanding of how God has transformed the work that we do and how we bring his power to bear in the work that we do. So encourage you to look into that. Also want to direct your attention. Uh, if you don't get our weekly email or weekly update, we can sign you up for that. Give us your email and we'll get you hooked up with that. And it gives you all the information. Also, if you want to make a donation, you can go to our website, sunlightlakeworth.com and make a donation to the ministry of this church. That would mean uh, the world to us, and God will use it in powerful ways. Also, so many announcements. I had to put a, a, a slide up. We've got a lot going on in our church. Thanksgiving meals. We're going to big pie and bread. Love Lake Worth. We're going to go out and do projects on November 21st, so be a part of that. Light up Lake Worth. You can make a donation. Just write it on your check or in the donation on PayPal that you want it to go to Light Up Lake Worth. And we're going to provide for those whose power is being cut off the Walk for Life, you can email Kim at sunlightcc.org, Kim at sunlightcc.org to find out, to sponsor her as she does the Walk for Life. Prayer, we pray for our community. Saturdays, 8 a.m., right out in front of City Hall. We're going to do it on the night of Election Eve. We're going to be out, the, be out there with other churches at 7 p.m. It's not a protest. We're just praying and loving our city. And finally, Angel Tree is coming. We're going to give you more details as that comes along. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine on you, especially in your work, through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.